Good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm excited today because we're talking about a little bit more of an off the beaten track destination, Sudan. Also one that has nothing to do with wildlife, but such a rich cultural heritage and a little bit more in common with Egypt and Ethiopia and ancient civilizations around the Middle East as well. And we're very fortunate to have Carla Piazza with us from ITC Sudan. She's, I consider her the foremost expert on all things Sudan and spends a, a large time of the year living in Sudan and basically run the prominent premier DMC operation there that some of you may be familiar with already. A few years ago, Brooke and I actually had the chance to travel with Carla around Sudan. And I will say to this day, it is one of the most fascinating, interesting, moving trips that I've done, uh, you know, that you can pack into, you know, a week or 10 days. Uh, just amazing variety. And, and I, I literally felt like Indiana Jones walking through some of these amazing World Heritage sites with not another soul in sight you know, the first footprints in the sand for that day. So it is definitely something special. It is safe, it is interesting. And with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Carla who will walk us through a presentation on and an introduction to Sudan. And then we'll come back and answer questions afterwards. So over to you, Carla. Thank you, Johan, and welcome everyone. Salam Alaikum. Yes, we speak Arabic in Sudan. I'm going to speak English to you. Um, I'm in Italy at the moment, and you may also hear some of my Italian accent. <laughs> uh, I was in Sudan until the end of March. Normally, our operations run between October and uh, the end of April. But of course, we had to cut the season short. And so I was forced to come back because all the airports were closed and I didn't want to spend the whole summer in Sudan. It's too hot in summer in Sudan. Um, while from October to April, the weather is quite nice, sunny every day. And uh, yeah, it can get quite warm, but it's always very dry. It's a typical desert climate. So I would like to take you through a virtual journey across Sudan today. So, um, First of all, let's talk a little bit about safety. I'm a woman, a blonde Italian woman in Sudan. What do I do there? The company I work for is called ITC Sudan, which stands for Italian Tourist Company Sudan. Yes, it is an Italian investment, but the company is fully Sudanese, is registered in Sudan, and there's only five Italians in the company and about 100 of Sudanese uh, colleagues. So we're based in Khartoum, which is the capital. And uh, just as a support to my Sudanese colleagues, uh, fantastic local Sudanese guides, drivers, cooks, office staff, and the two properties we own, I'm uh, based there between October and April, just to give them a, an extra help and be sure that we actually uh, deliver to the guest what we promised to the tour operators. So it's just a supervising job, just to give the little extra touch. And as an Italian woman in Sudan, I feel perfectly safe. I can go around Khartoum at night, helping now with transfers sometimes. I don't need to cover my hair, although it's a Muslim country. It's not such a strict country. People are extremely friendly. Uh, all you hear when you walk through the streets is welcome, welcome, because they see you as a foreigner. But then when I speak, they said, oh, but you're not a foreigner, you're Sudanese. <laughs> That's the type of people I, uh, I meet regularly in Sudan. So it is safe. Uh, it's, there is no need to cover up, uh, just dress modestly, short sleeves, long trousers as a woman or a man, but no need to cover our hair. So uh, it is a friendly, safe country, despite the reputation, of course. Uh, and now I want to show you, sharing my screen, some of the beauties that Sudan has to offer. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Uh, do you allow me, John, to share my screen? Oops. Let me just make sure I've got that on. 
That's a new feature of feature of Zoom. So sorry about that. You're back. Yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> Here we go. And if I I want to do like this so you can see full screen. Can you see it, John? Yes, we're on. Perfect. So here we are, 20 years in Sudan. It's a long time. Uh, yes, we registered a company exactly uh, in 2000. So 20 years, we, were plan we are still planning a lot of celebration from October onwards to celebrate our 20 years anniversary in the country. Uh, but first of all, where is Sudan? <laughs> because it is still so unknown. You wouldn't believe how many times I'm in travel show and they ask me, oh, you are in South Africa. And they say, no, Sudan, so nothing to do with it. We are further north. So as you can see from this map, Khartoum is the capital. And so we are basically southern part of Egypt. And then we are bordering Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan, which is an independent country since 2011. Then we have Chad and we have Libya um, on the west. So the capital is Khartoum and it's uh, actually an iconic point because uh, the White Nile and the Blue Nile joins in the capital of Khartoum. From Khartoum to the Egyptian border, the Nile River makes these unusual bends and then it flows up all the way to the Mediterranean seas. But so actually the Nile River starts in Khartoum, uh, joining the two other uh, Niles. So there are three Niles in Sudan. All along the Nile River, there's a number of temples, pyramids. By the way, there are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt. So a little bit of history as we are on the map. Just to keep it short, Sudan had an independent civilization located in the area of Kerma. The Egyptian had difficulties in conquering Sudan, the great Egyptian kingdom. Eventually they made it in 1500 BC, defeated the local pre-dynastic civilization and colonized Sudan, creating a very important uh, capital in Sudan, which is the actual Karima. Eventually, the Sudanese ruled over Egypt for a hundred years as pharaohs, also known as the Black Pharaohs, yes, because Sudanese are black-skinned people. And uh, when the Egyptian, uh, when they lost power over Egypt, they moved the capital to Meroe, continuing building pyramids well after the Egyptian stopped building pyramids. This is why we have such a large number of pyramids. And then Sudan became Christians and only from the 15th century onwards, Muslim. So we are based in Khartoum and we have two properties located in the two UNESCO sites, which are Karima and Meroe. Plus we have a temporary camp located in the northern area to allow people also to combine Sudan with Egypt. Uh, and I'm gonna show you the property as we, go, as we go on. So, three reasons to come to Sudan. Very simple, archeology, span pyramids, temples. Unspoiled environment. I have to say that Sudan is possibly one of the least visited country in the world. We're talking a few thousand visitors for tourist purposes every year, in a good year, really. And uh, something that really will touch your heart are the people. So genuine, so friendly, they are completely unspoiled by tourists. They don't try to sell, they don't try to beg. And for this, the country is also very safe for the nature and the soul of the Sudanese people. A typical journey would start in the capital Khartoum. 
Khartoum is the typical African city, uh, crowded, uh, polluted. Um, but there are so many interesting things related both to the colonial time, yes, because Sudan was actually part of the British uh, colony until 1956, when it then became independent. Um, there's been uh, American movies uh, uh, talking about the history of Sudan, the recent history, history of Sudan, like the movie Charlton Heston, Khartoum. And this is the mausoleum, what we see now, of uh, one of the uh, famous uh, leaders in Sudan who actually defeated uh, Gordon uh, from, from Britain, uh, the Mahadi. All this story is actually in the movie Khartoum. But also Sudan is a very interesting uh, national museum because with the flood of the high dam in, in Egypt of Aswan, everybody knows about moving Abu Simbel to a higher place and save that amazing temple. But also a number of Sudanese temples would have gone under the lake if uh, they didn't move it. So a uh, about four temples were actually moved from the north to Khartoum and um, rebuilt them in the, in the National Museum. And this is why it's so important to start the journey uh, across the history of Sudan from the National Museum of Khartoum. Another iconic point, as I said earlier, is the meeting point of the Blue and White Nile. So when the, white, uh, when the rivers are low in the level of water, normally from February onward, we can clearly see the colors, uh, which are very different between the two Niles. And then the market and the people. So Ondurman market is the largest market in Sudan. We call it Souk in Arabic. And that we have the opportunity to chit chat to people. Very few people speak English actually, but they try their best to let you feel well. Again, when you walk to the market, all you hear is the word marhab, marhab, which means welcome. And also the word khawaja. Khawaja is the local word for white people. But it's not discriminatory, it's simply because we are of different color. And uh, they say it with a smile. And when I say Anakawaja in the Sudani, they start laughing with their beautiful white teeth. And there we go. Uh, we always time uh, a trip uh, to Sudan to have a Friday or a Saturday in Khartoum so that we can see the events like every Friday there are the dervish uh, performing or praying all together it's not done for tourists nothing is done for tourists in Sudan so this is a religious ceremony where hundreds of people gather on a Friday in a cemetery praying all together lifting the energy up to reach the God we're allowed to to see them we're allowed to take photographs and in other uh, days there is also the Nuba wrestling. Um, the Nuba is a, actually uh, a tribe in uh, Kordofan, one of the region of Sudan, and they have this traditional uh, wrestling sport and it's just fascinating because of not just because of the sport but for all the people that are uh, watching this sport. Great photographic opportunity there. And then we start the journey north. So we start our presentation from one of the two UNESCO sites, which is actually Jebel Barkal. Jebel in Arabic means mountain. This is the mountain, which has this unique pinnacle, which according to the old Egyptian, represent the ureo uh, of uh, the gods. So according to the Egyptian, the god Amun, one of the most important gods, was originally from so at the base, there's a number of temples, even inside the mountain. Some of them are well preserved, like uh, this one, which is dedicated to the wife of the god Amun, the Mut uh, goddess. And we can visit necropolis or tomb. This is the tomb of Queen Kalahata and also more pyramids. As I said, there is 
large number of pyramids. It's just the first that you'll see. <laughs> this is the necropolis of uh, Nuri. Actually, the archaeology in Sudan, it's a living archaeology. Uh, there are about 29 archaeological missions that every year comes to Sudan between uh, November and April to dig and make new discovery in Sudan. For example, here in Nuri, in the last uh, couple of years, there is um, an American mission and they've been opening up tombs and discovering incredible frescoes, really well preserved. So when I say living archaeology, it's because when sometimes when we walk through the site, we have the pleasure of meeting archaeology and we can organize that for special guests as well uh, when the archaeologists are there. And uh, last year we had a number of National Geographic and many other film crew coming and filming, especially here, because these tombs below the, the, the pyramids are actually flooded with water. So there's a special archaeologist who is a, who is a diver, diver archaeologist. And um, the history gets rewritten uh, every year, I would say, in Sudan, as they go on discovering new uh, things. Sudan was also Christian, so we see ruins of the old Christian kingdoms. For example, these are the ruins of Old Ongola. Uh, where there are columns, capitals, simply left in the desert. Also here, there's a Polish archaeologist digging every winter. But, and this is Kerma. So Kerma was prior to the arrival of the Egyptian. These seven statues representing seven black pharaohs was discovered only in 2003 by a Swiss archaeological mission. Professor Charles Bonnet has been digging in Sudan for 55 years. He's 82 years old now, and still he comes out three months of the year because he can't keep away from Sudan. So I was saying earlier that the Egyptian had difficulties in conquering Sudan and defeating the Kerma civilization. And the reason are the cataracts, so rapids, that makes the navigation quite impossible. So they had to wait to have horses, which only were allowed, uh, were available in Egypt since 1500 BC. And they had to take the boats out of the Nile, cross long uh, stretch of land, bypass the cataract, and then put the boats back into the Nile. So it was a challenging task. And uh, this is the cataract. Uh, after all, it's a spectacular um, natural scene to see. This is the third cataract. But the Egyptian also left some amazing temples behind. So this is the Solib temple built uh, by Amenophis III, which was the um, grandfather of um, Tutankhamun. Uh, was the father of Akhenaton. So we are talking big names of pharaohs. There's a lot of history in Sudan also related to the Egyptian times. But the special thing is really the people. So everything that's north of Khartoum is also known as the Nubian region. So that's why we call it the Nubian village. In a specific region in the north, people have this tradition of painting the houses. It is a little bit lost recently due to the economical crisis. The painting have a cost, uh, but there are still some houses which are painted and she's beautiful, Zakia. I don't know if you can see, but she has purification on her cheeks. And that's a, a symbolism of beauty. Um, they still do it sometimes also to younger girls. Um, which identify the, the tribe, where they come from, and the deeper are the scarification, the better looking is the lady. And again, ladies in the Nubian villages. Every time we pass by, okay, now they know me, but even if they wouldn't know me, they would still invite me in 
for tea, for coffee. They want to share what they have. They have very little, but they want to share it because they're so proud of their land. And of course, we are travelers. For them, we are not tourists. Maybe they think we are NGO workers or UN workers, or, but they invite us in because they want to share what they have with us. So they're very hospitable. Mm. And continuing, we reach uh, the second UNESCO site, which is the Meroe Necropolis. This is the most accessible site in Sudan because it's only about four hours north of the capital but there are 44 pyramids still standing. There were about 220 pyramids uh, originally just in this area. And uh, what John said before, it's very rare to meet other people while you're visiting any site in Sudan. So imagine to have uh, 44 pyramids and just you inside. So best seen at sunrise because all the pyramids are facing east but also the sunset is quite spectacular as you can see um, they're very different from the egyptian pyramids so they're smaller for sure we go for numbers not for size um, because they change the technique they change uh, the material so they were in this time completely disconnected from the egyptians so they were free to build the pyramid as they like in their own style. And inside the offertory chapel, which is facing east, there is also a number of carvings. Uh, imagine that this civilization, the Meroitic civilization, which is post Egyptian, lasted for about 800 years. They developed their own writing, which is still today not fully known. So the archaeologists are also working on decrypting this, uh, uh, this writing. Sudan had uh, two um, autoptic writing, the Meroitic, and also during the Christian time, they developed their own writing. I don't know how many civilizations in the world can actually um, claim to have developed two uh, way of writing. Here we are on the way back to Khartoum. Look at this side, this is Naga. This is clearly a mix of style. We have the Roman, the Roman arch, we have Egyptian uh, ureos, and we have the Roman Greek column. So 2000 years old chapel dedicated to Hathor and the, the lion temple back here. And now I don't know if you can see, but here we have a king and we have a queen. These are Meroitic. Uh, royals. The queen is as tall as her royal husband and she is uh, well a little bit overweight we would say. These queens were ruling, were ruling at the same level of their husband. So this was a truly matriarchal society. The queens in the Meroitic time were called Kandake and they were fearless and they had to be well fed and in good health it's very different because when we think about egyptian the queens were always portrayed very skinny but this is an african civilization so it's a matriarchal society so extremely interesting because then we understand why still today the sudanese women although in a Muslim environment, are so strong and ruling the family. Uh, it, it's a very interesting tour, Stan, because it's not just archaeology. There is so much to discover, although the archaeology is very important. Imagine this uh, civilization who actually had access to elephant. Now, the area, it's completely deserted. We come to the desert later. But in the past, 2000 years ago, there were elephants. And this is an example uh, of the statue. This is Musawara Tesufra. Here, the, the, the elephant and the lions uh, were actually um, raised and raised and then sold to the Roman Empire. We go back to people, the nomads. 
there's still a large number of population in Sudan, especially in the desert, which lives a semi nomadic or semi nomadic life. And this picture was taken now. I mean, they still fetch their water from a um, desert well. In, uh, this is a step back in time. Here, here the time hasn't passed. And there's still some kids that would cry when they when they see me with the blue eyes because I never seen blue eyes before. And this is the typical way to cross the Nile. Well, I'm in Sudan 20 years, I said, but in 2007 they actually built some bridges on the Nile. Um, before that, the only way to get across the Nile was on ferry. And even today, to follow our itinerary, we always use the traditional ferry at least once to cross the Nile and share the space uh, together with goats or camels or the local, because the encounter with them is just, it's just interesting, it's just nice. So the northern part of Sudan is, uh, is basically desert. Um, there are three different deserts in Sudan. And, uh, and possibly the Meroic civilization, who was so advanced and cut down so many trees, uh, possibly speeded up the desertification of this part of the Sahara Desert. Um, so now the, 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 the deserts are separated by the Nile and have very different geological configuration. So we go from the sandy desert of the west and Nubian Desert, the volcanic origin of the Bayuda Desert. And this is the Eastern Desert. There is no hotel in this area, but around this uh, mountain, there is one of the largest concentration of petroglyphs in all the Sahara Desert. Just that to reach it, the only way is to do an expedition in Y Camp. Just imagine, okay, when I see the desert, I also think about uh, our toilet stop in Sudan. <laughs> so Sudan is a, is a developing country. And uh, when we go from one area to the others, it's not, we don't find uh, um, places where to stop and, and, and have uh, a restaurant break or restroom break. So we, think that the best way to relieve yourself is to choose your own sand dune or your own bush. And that's the cleanest toilet ever you can find in many different parts of Africa, not only Sudan. Sudan is facing the Red Sea. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Red Sea in Egypt. Well, in Sudan, there is no resort. As a matter of fact, there is not even beaches, but there is the best reef, unspoiled reef you can think of. It is totally to be developed. Um, really, the only way to access the incredible reef of Sudan is through a boat. The best season to do uh, snorkeling or diving in Sudan would be uh, the month of October, when the manta ray uh, migrates to reproduce themselves in the northern part, or uh, um, between March and uh, uh, end of May, when is the hammerhead uh, season. There are just a few boats, and uh, normally they are leave boats where you spend a week uh, on it and um, to do snor snorkeling or diving really pristine environment. I lived in Australia for many years. I know the Australian reef very well, which is incredible. But when I put my head under the water of the Red Sea in Sudan, I, wouldn't, I couldn't believe my eyes. And especially nothing, nobody around. It's just that boat and that's it. This is such an example, just an example of the petroglyphs in, uh, in the Red Sea hills. This shows that just a few thousand years back, Sudan wasn't, wasn't as desert as it is now. You can tell from the number of large herds of cows and there is lions. Actually, lions only disappeared in Sudan 
uh, in the 19th century. And here we are back in Khartoum. This is our office and the house where I'm staying when I'm there. And uh, it's a trip four by four, it's a four by four trip. Um, yeah, Land Cruiser or Toyota Hilux. We carry then chairs with us, we carry tables for the picnic. The drivers are really safe and very professional. And here we go. This is one of our property. This is the Nubia Rest House in Karima. 24 rooms on suite, all with this uh, cupola, dome, all uh, locally produced material, very nice entrance door, which is, comes from the from the Nubian villages, it's a traditional Nubian village door. It's Asha, my friend. And this is the distance of our property to the archaeological site of Jebel Barkal, basically 200 meters, five minutes walk. It's an oasis in the desert, completely built in a Nubian traditional style. It's just relaxing to be there. All the rooms are two bedded, very large beds. Okay, everything is handmade. There is no IKEA in Sudan. So <laughs> everything is designed and produced by the local artists. You can see the cupola up here, it's really pretty. And when the night comes, then we use still the old fanus to give uh, a nice uh, feeling uh, to the property. Um, just one thing, we like to support local community. So all the stuff is local or coming from the, from the area. And uh, we also organize traditional parties here with the local musician, uh, with the simple instruments they play. And what I love about it is that, okay, we enjoy, we take photos, but then who they enjoy most is the staff of the property because then they call in all their families and it becomes a, a real nice moment of encounter with the local population. The second property is um, our Meroe camp. So here we are at the pyramids of Meroe, 22 tents, large, sufficiently comfortable with two beds. Each tent has got its own uh, uh, private showers and toilets which is located just at the back of the tent. So it is not en suite, it is behind. And I tell you the reason why, because this camp is right in the middle of the desert. And the desert is very dry. And the bathroom has got water, which obviously attracts, uh, because the water is the light in the desert, attracts maybe crickets, maybe scarabs. Hmm? And so it's better if the water is outside of the tents. Our staff control the, and cleans the bathroom constantly. And the tent is absolutely free of any guests, if not ourselves. This uh, tent actually overlooks the amazing pyramids of Meroe, which are located about two kilometers away. We are uh, opening up a brand new restaurant uh, next October and we are upgrading the tent to become bungalows uh, but this is still gonna be uh, a little while before they will be finished. When they will be bungalow then they will be actually en suite. And the third and final property is a temporary one. Here we are near the border with Egypt further north. So between October and April, we put these large South African tents with 10 beds and some simple but very important toilets and shower. And um, so for people that love archaeology, they want to see everything, they want to stay longer in Sudan, this is the best solution. They're very comfortable. They're South African tents. Uh, you can actually stand up. This was a big German guest and that's why I selected him because he's not a skinny person Just to give you the idea how comfortable the tent can actually be. Then we put hot water here just to wash your hands and your face early in the morning 
and the shower are located just a, a little distance from here. Amazing location with all this granite boulder cataract. Yeah, basic, but they do their job. We organize also for special uh, occasion, we can organize private dining in the desert, we can organize a special sundown, not inside the archaeological site, we want to keep it as pristine as possible, but in a very nice location looking out at the pyramid at sunset. And now we're back in Khartoum. Uh, in Khartoum there's the enough choice of hotel, the best one is Corinthia Hotel, five star. Um, it's quite a modern egg shape, also known as the Gaddafi egg, yes, because it's actually an investment from uh, Libya. Um, it's managed by a Maltese company, which is Corinthian, overlooking uh, the Blue Nile. And then uh, we also offer a four star hotel, with, but it's colonial style. Uh, next door to Corinthia. So basically we have se normally select a five, a four, and also an extremely clean three-star hotel for more budget travel. Our guides, this is just a selection of our guides. Um, so all, all of them speak second language, all of them speak English, of course, and Arabic. But uh, we actually invited all our guides to come to Europe. Um, to learn a second language during the summer. So we have Hamid who went to Spain for two summers and he speaks Spanish. We have Khalid and Diva, yes, a Sudanese lady guide. Uh, that in addition to English, they speak both Italian and Khalid also speaks German as well. So he speaks three languages, incredible. And Dr. Hatim Noor, this one in the middle, we actually lost him as a guide because well, he speaks also French in addition to English because with the new government of Sudan, I don't know if you heard that last year, we actually had a peaceful revolution who uh, ended the 30 years dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. And so now there is a temporary government who's uh, getting rid of all the corruption that belonged to the previous regime. And uh, our colleague, Dr. Hati Manur, with a PhD in uh, archaeology, Meroitic Times, he was selected last January and appointed to become uh, the director of the Museum and Antiquities of Sudan. So congratulations. We have lost an excellent guide but Sudan has gained an incredible director of his antiquities. Um, to be uh, in Sudan, it cannot be just business, of course. <laughs> you, you need to give something back. The communities are incredible. So we have selected a couple of schools uh, where part of our income uh, gets uh, uh, sent to, um, especially this one is near the pyramids of Meroe. So our colleagues in the Meroe camp can actually um, supervise uh, the, 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 the work and manage uh, all the money that we collect to be sure that everything goes to the school. We started with two classrooms and now we have completed uh, the male section and we are on the way to finish also the ladies section so that also girls can study up to, um, to end uh, the primary school in the desert. So, now we look forward to welcome you to Sudan. Uh, the journey ends here with the beautiful photos of the Meroe pyramid and the desert. And uh, next time, I'm sure I'll meet you in Sudan. Back to you, Joan. Thank you so much, Carla, for that uh, beautiful overview of the country. I, I know, I mean, you can go on for two hours. I mean, you know, just doing it justice and seeing everything uh, that, that Sudan has to offer for all of us. Um, 
I'll never remember drive, you'll forget like uh, driving through the desert for two hours and coming up to that tribe that was on the move from one place to another. And, you know, just mm -hmm. the people being so friendly and they actually had their little daughter named Carla, you know, after you. She's probably uh, a couple <laughs> years young uh, or older now. And then Five years now, Johan. <laughs> wow. Yeah, she was yes. uh, just about three years ago. And then yeah. getting, to, getting to that well and, and, you know, where people still spend the majority of their day getting water out of a, you know, couple of hundred, you know, 200 meter deep well and, you know, dragging up one bag at a time, you know, using the original goat skins. I mean, there is nothing modern around that. And, and I think Sudan actually lent itself a lot to social distancing because, you know, when you're out at the sites, there are no crowds, there are no masses of people around. So between the dry climate and being so remote and having something so interesting, it could be quite, a, uh, quite an option these days. Um, a question about the, how long is the, of a drive is it from Khartoum to the destinations? Maybe just kind of gives us an eye, give a bit of an idea, sure. especially to the Absolutely. major areas. Sure. Um, well, it's, uh, it can be up to five hours drive, uh, especially Khartoum Karima is a five hour drive, 400 kilometers. I'm sorry, I don't speak miles. Um, and Karima to uh, Meroe it, across the Bayuda Desert is another five hours drive. But we stretch it to the whole day because there are things to see. We stop, we have tea with the nomads. So, Yes, especially three days it, uh, out of a week trip in Sudan can be a long drive, uh, but we try to take our time and stop uh, often uh, for sand dunes, for nomads, for ruins, so that it becomes not just a transfer, but it becomes an excursion. Yeah, and the vehicles are very comfortable, they're air conditioned, there's always lots of water, um, lots of planning goes ahead for lunch stops along the way. So definitely, I mean, there are some longer drives, but they're not, uh, there's lots to see along the way. Another question pertaining to that is, do you use a driver and a guide or only local guides and driver brings uh, clients, you know, around the different areas? Or is a driver and a guide the same the same person? No, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately for the guides, the drivers do not speak English. As, as I said earlier, very few people speak English in Sudan. So we have professional uh, full-time guides. We do not use freelancers uh, at all. These are our own exclusive guides. Um, we, um, so there is a driver and a guide. Um, but on occasion, we do get requests of people that uh, are not so much into archaeology and they just want to get around just with the driver. The driver are professional, they can understand, although they don't speak that well, but they know when to stop, they know how to, where to bring you, they know when they need to stop in a good place for toilets. So, but they will not give uh, information about the culture or the archaeology. So, if your clients are into archaeology, they definitely need to have a guide. If they are just fine to, to have a look around and enjoy as local as possible, then I trust my driver 100%. Although I wouldn't want to miss out on those guides. I mean, they were phenomenal in mm. the knowledge that they share. And if you're going halfway around the world to see that, you know, you should have the best guide with you. And speaking of that, is it possible to combine with Southern Egypt? Is it possible to cross the border or get picked up there? And, you know, how long do you normally, you know, would you spend in uh, or recommend in Sudan in combination with that? Okay. Yes, yes, it's possible to combine. So um, let us talk a little bit about the visa first, because that's very important. So uh, everybody needs a visa to enter Sudan. And it's easy to get tourist visa. Uh, we issue letter of invitation for uh, the Sudanese embassies uh, all over the world, including Washington. And with our letter of invitation, Washington Sudanese embassy will issue a tourist visa. 
passport must not have uh, Israeli visa, as many you know, Islamic countries uh, have this problem, um, and must have six months validity and two free pages. Uh, so if you have a visa in your passport, you can come in from also the land border, including Egypt or Ethiopia. Uh, if you do not have the visa, or you cannot send your passport to Washington to get the visa or to the embassy to get the visa in advance, then we can organize a visa on arrival. It's a pre-organized visa. We prepare a number of uh, paperwork which generates a PDF, which is your entry permit. When you check in for the cartoon flight, they want to check your visa, you show the PDF, but that's just the proof that you will get the visa. And the visa on arrival is available only at the Khartoum airport. So it's not allowed in the land border. So um, once you have the visa also on arrival at the Khartoum airport, we help uh, the guests when they arrive, we lead them to immigration and so on. So uh, let us say that it's easier to organize a trip going from Sudan to Egypt because of the visa. Huh? It is possible, uh, our uh, preset camp up in uh, Tombos, it's three and a half hours away from the Egyptian border. There is a land border. Up to a few years ago, the only way to cross over to Egypt was uh, through Lake Nasser on a weekly ferry. Uh, but now there is a land border. So we leave early in the morning, our preset camp. We reach the border by 10 o'clock. We have a fixer there to help to get across. We can organize a simple but private vehicle to, to go through no man's land. And then once you are in Egypt, you find your Egyptian partner and you are 30 kilometers to the ferry that gets across the Nasser Lake into Abu Simbel right at the back of Abu Simbel Temple. This is a border which is open every day, excluding uh, Fridays. Of course, then if you have a visa on your passport, you, you can do the reverse process. You come in from Abu Simbel, we meet you at the Sudanese border, and we take you to our Meroe Temple, three and a half hours. Great, thank you for that. And uh, you yeah, know, definitely, a fascinating country to combine with Egypt and I also find it interesting combining with some parts of Ethiopia because yes. the Aksumite kingdom in the northern part of Ethiopia you know is very closely related to the Nubian side and you know power has shifted between these different areas over time and it's it's just that that whole region has such a an interesting history as it is. Um, Let me add a little piece of history. Sorry to interrupt, John. A little piece of history. You know, we were talking about the Meroitic civilization, which ended more or less in the fourth century AD. And we and why? Because there is no uh, uh, specific reason unless you go to Aksum. When you go to Aksum, uh, 356, I think, the con uh, King Ezzana converted to Christianism and actually there is a stele saying that they defeated the Noba, which is possible one of the name of the Meroitic civilization. There is the possibility that actually the Aksumai kingdom actually defeated the Meroitic kingdom. So they became the most power, powerful kingdom in the region and so Mero lost its power and faded as a civilization. So combination with Ethiopia, it's uh, very, very interesting because they share part of the history and it is a completely different environment. So you have the desert in Sudan and you have the highlands in Ethiopia. So it's like two completely different worlds in, a, in, in neighboring countries, completely different people, completely different language, completely different religion. It's, uh, it's, it's a mini Africa trip, I would say, if you combine the two countries. But I would not suggest to drive across. It is a, really, I speak frankly, it is a boring drive between Khartoum and the Ethiopian border. It is um, recommendable to fly. There are, in good times, there are three flights a day between Khartoum and Addis Ababa. 
and it's a one hour flight. So it's very easy. While it would be a day and a half drive to the border. So it's easier to fly. And just a quick question on uh, ITC does not arrange itineraries in Egypt. You work with a partner. I think you answered yeah. that sort of uh, in the same with Ethiopia. And exactly. of course, I work with Kibran in Ethiopia. So if you have any questions, <laughs> I can help as much as possible. About the diving, you know, is there a place to stay and do day trips out? Is it liveaboard? Do they have equipment you can rent? Is it paddy? And how large are the schools of hammerheads? <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> um, apparently, they are very large <laughs> because I went uh, on, a, on a diving trip once. I was the only one that didn't dive, so I enjoy snorkeling alone, the best experience ever. Everybody was down and I was alone up. And they've seen huge school of hammerhead shark. Um, now, the liver boat is the best way to see it. There are hotels in Port Sudan, um, but they're not high standard of hotels. I mean, the best one is the former Hilton Hotel, which is now Coral. So let's say four stars. Uh, and then to go out it, on a day trip, you mainly find fishermen boat, which are sometimes not equipped. Uh, I mean, they can have diving gears, no problem. You can, there are diving centers in Port Stan, but uh, they're, uh, that they don't have really like stairs to go up. They're not modern uh, diving boats. The best option would be uh, to charter or to jump on a, on a weekly liver boat. And there are some nice liver boats. There are gullet, I mean, not that many, five or six to choose from. And uh, they normally do the seven nights uh, crew. And I forgot to say something. Up to today, it is still a dry country, Sudan. Not just because of the desert, but also for the alcohol. Uh, things may change. Things may change uh, with the new government. There are rumors that they are working on it. Um, but when you are on a liver boat, because you leave the coast of Port Sudan, you can actually also enjoy your beer and glass of wine. Yeah, I think uh, that's the, the only negative I had for myself for Sudan. It's like, you know, after a while you start drinking alcohol-free beers just to get the taste of a beer or something. In. <laughs> but it's a hot climate. It's, it's nice to, to, to have a cold beverage. But the hibiscus tea and the, the one made from with oh, the bad, fruit, I mean, they're, those are also very good memories. Um, another question about, uh, you know, on a 10-day tour, for example, how much walking is there in a normal day? And how much can we vary it, you know, per client and mobility, I would say? Sure. Well, uh, the, the walking is not that much. I mean, you see the images of the archaeological sites. Uh, we can adapt. We can get the car to get as close as possible to the site. Um, it's not a strenuous walk, although the, 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 the ground is uneven, so you do need nice, uh, steady shoes. But I would say the, um, the longest walk you have to do is for Jebel Barkal, which would be a few hundred meters, really. The Meroe Pyramids, ah, they, you know, Johan, I forgot to tell you, they made the new entrance of the Meroe Pyramids. So they actually made, uh, yes, unbelievable, as we suggested to do on the southern side. So you don't see the pyramids when you enter. I mean, you've seen it from the road, but then when you enter, now the, there is a little bit more to walk. Uh, it's the, behind the Jebel, behind the mountain, and then all of a sudden you see all the pyramids together. The location is spectacular, the photo is incredible. But now there is a little bit more to walk in the pyramid. I would say, speaking kilometers, to see the whole pyramid, it would be a kilometer and a half. So it's about an hour and a half taking it easy with the explanation. I have to admit that uh, we always have plan B, which are the camels. Camels are available. They support the local communities. They are very friendly. They, uh, they don't smell bad at all because the people <laughs> of Sudan love their camel. They keep it as clean as possible. Um, so we can do it one way 
uh, with the explanation working very slow and I had people even doing it with walking sticks, no problem. Uh, and then they can come back with a camel. We can organize a donkey, which is maybe a bit, little bit lower and, um, and, and that would be easier. But yes, the mirror pyramid about kilometers and a half. Then we also offer to climb the small mountains of Jebel Barkal, um, which is uh, 100 meters. So it's not a mountain, it's just a small pebble, let's say. Uh, but this is an optional activity if they want to do it. Uh, most of the people can do it. If uh, they don't feel like climbing up to see the sunset, they can enjoy an amazing sunset sitting in the middle of the pyramids. So there is always a plan B. Uh, to enjoy the area if they don't feel like walking too much. I have also to add uh, that the uh, majority of the people that come to Sudan uh, are actually very well-traveled, experienced people. So the average age is uh, above 50, so well above 50s. We get 80 years old Japanese all the time. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, and so and most of the time they can do basically everything. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I'm not much of a camel person, but I will say the little camel ride, it was quite nice. And, and they were clean, I guess, you know, it's kind of like someone keeping his car washed and clean here, you know, like they really look after exactly. the camels very well. A question about, uh, do you have set departures? What sort of approximate pricing, you know, on the four or five star level? And uh, do we also do FITs? So basically in Sudan, we can do from FITs to group uh, to private departure. We do have scheduled departures in, in English language and in other languages. Um, so let, let us say a standard Kingdom of the Black Pharaohs tour, which is uh, all accommodated in Karim and Meroe, avoiding the further north, avoiding the temporary camp, let's say. Uh, on a um, on a five star base, we are looking at two thousand five hundred euros uh, as a, as an average price. Huh? Um, it's a full board, uh, with the exception of the dinners in Khartoum. Normally, it has to be a full board because when you are out of Khartoum, you have no options. So we try to give you the best experience in food as well. But when you are in Khartoum, you may can, you may choose your own uh, your own restaurant, or we can include everything. So we can do FITs uh, with no problem. As I said, we do have English speaking guides. So fantastic. And and then there's a, a question: If uh, tourism is open at this time, and I think it's the first part of that answer is that it's the hot time of the year now. So there's strictly yes. no tourism this time of the year, regardless. Regardless. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, uh, you know, what's the situation with COVID? Do we feel uh, yeah. mm. hard or not? Sure. Well, when I, when I left Sudan, well, I have to admit that when I was in Sudan, uh, we tried to convince Sudan uh, Minister of Health to close the border earlier than what they did. Because, yeah, because we wanted to prevent Sudan. I was watching what was happening in Europe, you know, and in Italy especially but they they didn't close it and um, but it came later so at the moment uh, we they have about 400 uh, person passed passed away so the numbers are still lower comparing to the states or to italy um but everything is closed uh, there are about 4000 recorded cases of covid they are in lockdown and they will be in lockdown at least until the 18th of june this for the time being uh, and then they will monitor the situation. Um, they are receiving help from the international community. The UN is there strongly helping them. Um, they think about they will open the airport by the end of June. It's closed completely now. And the borders even within the states of Sudan, so the full lockdown. We have a big hope that the hot weather, uh, the fact uh, that they are used to many other problems maybe they will keep the infection lower comparing uh, to western countries but we hope so anyway we hope that by october everything will be over for sudan for the states for italy and we can still plan our season 
uh, as normal. So far, we are open for business from October. Yeah, we have a very, very, sorry, we have a very relaxed cancellation policy due to COVID, so no problem. Eh? We will refund uh, if you cannot travel. Trust us. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, and that situation remains so fluid at the moment through so many of the different countries in Africa. So, you know, hopefully we'll get all get back to normal soon. And I think that's sort of most of the questions. I'm sorry, I will send the Q&A to Carla as well in case we miss something or can go in a little bit more depth with that. Um, I'll send you a recording of this tomorrow as well and Carla's details. So, Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or um, anything that we can answer about Sudan. As I mentioned, it is one of the more interesting places that is easy to reach. You know, lots of flights there, especially you know, coming by Ethiopia as well or, or down from Egypt. I think I remember uh, the flight that Turkish. I took. And Turkish as well. So it's easy to get to. It's safe. It's unique. It's interesting. People hear Sudan and they think Darfur or South Sudan and stuff. And those are way far away from uh, the areas that you would go to. And as Carla mentioned, the people, it is just out of this world. I mean, the, 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 the friendliness and the way that, you know, it's like your, your long lost grandmother invites you into the home. And, you know, <laughs> it's just the, the, the interaction. A few places in the world you can go and it is still so untouched and have so much to offer. I mean, there's a lot of untouched places, but there's no reason for you to go there. Here, it is fascinating to go to. And um, as I say, I mean, it's like going to Luxor or somewhere in Egypt, but having no one else there. No tourists. So, so with that, feel free to reach out to Carla and I can also pass on information if you need on Anything Sudan, uh, I'll send you a link to the trip report that Brooke wrote about our visit there. It's about two, three years old now, but mostly still relevant. And yes, really absolutely fun. relevant. We really, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. And hopefully we'll see you soon at another webinar one of these days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you. Have a nice day. Ma salama. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.